Um, so welcome to our first Human Rights in Practice event of the spring semester on climate, environmental litigation, and human rights. Thanks to everyone for being here, both those in person, and we also have some people watching via live stream today. The Duke, human Li Duke Law Human Rights in Practice series is organized by the Center for International and Comparative Law and the International Human Rights Clinic. We're also very grateful to a couple of co-sponsors today, the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, the Duke Human Rights Center at the Franklin Humanities Institute, the Keenan Institute for Ethics, and three student groups, the Duke Environmental Law Society, the Human Rights Law Society, and the International Law Society. I'm also very happy to introduce our moderator for today's event, Professor Monica Iyer, who is the Clinical Fellow and Senior Lecturing Fellow in the Duke International Human Rights Clinic, who started with us in January, and we're really thrilled that she's here with us. And Professor Iyer herself has extensive experience, expertise and background in the area of climate change and human rights. So with that, I will hand it over to Professor Iyer. Thank you so much, Professor Fujimura Fonslo, and thank you to all of you for being here, and especially to our two excellent panelists who I will introduce right now. Uh, we have with us today Kristen Casper. Kristen Casper is the general counsel of Greenpeace International, where she leads their efforts to develop and implement cutting edge legal strategies to hold governments and corporations accountable for the climate emergency. In her time at Greenpeace, she has been a part of many successful efforts demanding urgent and ambitious climate action, the rapid transition to renewable energy, and the protection of the right to a healthy environment. In her current role, Kristen leads a team of specialized lawyers that provide independent legal advice on various matters. She is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Climate Justice Fund, a one-of-a-kind financial facility to support the development and use of legal avenues towards achieving global climate justice. Kristen is a graduate of the University of New Mexico School of Law. And our second panelist is Eva Oko. Eva Maria Anyango Okoth is a senior program officer with National Justice, or sorry, Natural Justice in Kenya, working on matters related to defending rights, affirming rights, and standing with communities. She has worked with communities affected by mega extractive infrastructural and conservation projects in the coastal and northern parts of Kenya. By supporting Natural Justice's legal empowerment approaches and litigation strategies, Eva Maria helps empower communities to enable them to assert their rights in environmental decision-making processes that can affect their social, economic, political, and cultural lives in significant ways. Eva Maria is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and holds a Master of Laws in Public International Law from the University of Nairobi. So uh, we'll ask each of our panelists to give a 10 to 15 minute presentation uh, starting with Kristen and then Eva, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, from the floor after that. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. So Kristen, please go ahead. Wonderful. Before I begin, oh, I can see the PowerPoint up there. Wonderful. Good afternoon, my name is Kristen Casper and I'm General Counsel at Greenpeace International. I want to thank Duke Law for this opportunity to highlight our approach to human rights. It's a privilege to share this space with Eva and Aya and Monica. I admire the work that they do to protect human rights. I also want to recognize that Duke produces leading lawyers breaking new ground on climate and environmental litigation. This includes my close colleague at Greenpeace International Amy Jacobson, who graduated from Duke Law, as well as Kevin Hannon, who graduated with a master's from the Nicholas School. He's a leading attorney working with Earth Rights International, representing Colorado communities and a critically important cost recovery case in climate litigation against fossil fuel companies. To begin with, I want to share a little bit about my personal journey as a lawyer applying human rights to address environmental destruction. In November 2013, Super Typhoon Haiyan slammed into the Philippines. Thousands died and millions are still affected. In the weeks following the storm, people began to ask, what role did climate change play in the storm? 
and who was responsible. They found answers in research. Earlier that year, Richard Heady published the groundbreaking carbon major study. He found that 90 carbon producers, the so-called carbon majors, were responsible for almost two thirds of historical emissions. This study was an aha moment for me and for many others. And this data added context to existing research into the role of fossil fuel companies in undermining climate science in action. Community leaders in the Philippines decided enough is enough. It was time to stand up to the fossil fuel companies that have long understood the risk posed by climate change, yet continue to produce, market, and sell oil, gas, and coal when used as directed presents an eminent and severe risk to fundamental human rights. In 2015, a large group of Filipinos, community organizations, and Greenpeace Southeast Asia submitted a petition to their Commission on Human Rights. They were asking for an investigation into the responsibility of the carbon majors for climate-related human rights harms. This was one of the first human rights-based legal petitions I had the opportunity to support as a lawyer. Climate change is now widely recognized as the greatest human rights issue of our time. People around the world are experiencing the impacts of climate change every day. This includes my own community in Boulder, Boulder, Colorado, an extreme gas grass fire destroyed nearly a thousand homes in December of last year. While attribution research is still underway, it is highly likely that global warming contributed to the destructive fires and the conditions that we are living in. I've witnessed through, my, through the eyes of my neighbors how climate change poses a risk to our human rights. So I'm committed now more than ever to protecting everyone's right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. But this right is under threat from the lack of action or actions by governments and businesses. A growing number of communities are taking legal action to secure their human rights and to hold these governments and fossil fuel companies accountable. The aim is to build the power of communities. Human rights lawyers and students like all of you are working day and night to protect this right. I'll just move my... So the, that's some photos of the communities in the Philippines working on that petition. So I asked um, and Monica asked me to discuss Greenpeace's approach to human rights. And I have a feeling that many people are scratching their heads and asking why Greenpeace, an organization knowing for campaigning on the high seas to stop whaling, is increasingly using human rights in its campaigns and in the courts. To understand why it's important, you need to know a little bit about Greenpeace and our mission. So Greenpeace is composed of 26 independent national and regional organizations located in over 55 countries as well as a coordinating body, Greenpeace International in the Netherlands. That's where I work. The network works directly with communities on the front lines as they protect the environments they call home. Greenpeace uses creative, peaceful confrontation to expose environmental problems and to develop the solutions for a green and peaceful future. Oops, um, just, sorry, my, my mouse is not working. The Greenpeace International Legal Unit, which I have the pleasure of being a part of, um, relies on human rights to pro pro proactively protect the planet and communities and defend freedom of expression, assembly, and the right to protest. You can see this in one, our strategic litigation to advance the fight against environmental destruction, and two, in our defense, our strategic defense of activists, campaigns, and organizations and staff, and also in our advocacy efforts to strengthen human rights. So now let me provide you with three concrete examples. And I'm gonna to try to go back in my slides, see if I can do that. Yes, I can. Excellent. So the first example is gonna come from strategic litigation. Last year, a number of unprecedented key judgments were issued. These have potentially far reaching impacts, including cases against Australia, Germany, and France and a claim against a fossil fuel company, Shell, in the Netherlands. Now more than ever, climate litigation is becoming a real threat for laggard governments and corporations that are not respecting human rights. A people power case that exemplifies human rights-based approach to shifting power and creating new mindsets and protecting environmental boundaries comes out of Switzerland. This case is so important because people, not the lawyers, are the heroes of the story. More than 18,000 women, 
age 65 and older through an association called Swiss Senior Women for Climate Protection have gone to court since 2016. They're challenging their government's inadequate climate policies, and they are requesting that the government take steps to protect their, their lives and their health from the impacts of climate-fueled heat waves. After being unsuccessful all the way through the domestic courts, they sailed to Strasbourg on a Greenpeace ship to announce their intention to take their case all the way up to the European Court of Human Rights. The association, as well as four women between the ages of 78 and 89 years old, filed an application to the court in November last year. So good news, the application um, has been accepted and it's being fast-tracked, but the application asked the court to clarify Switzerland's obligations in terms of Article 2, right to life, 8, right to respect for private, private and family life, as well as related Article 6, the right to judicial review, and Article 13, the right to an effective remedy. So with this expedited examination, um, we've already seen observations exchanged, um, and there's been third-party interventions on a wide range of issues, including an in intervention from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. While I don't have time to go into the details here, there is yet one more climate case before the court that I could go deeper into after the presentation. And this is an application by six individuals, Greenpeace Nordic, Nature and Youth, which is another organization against the Norwegian Aid, invoking the constitution, international human rights, environmental law, climate science, and the Paris Agreement in challenging the government's decision to issue new license for oil and gas drilling in the Arctic. This case is also supported by the Greenpeace International Legal Unit. So now let's move to strategic defense. As I mentioned at the beginning, Greenpeace engages, we're known for this, in confrontational, peaceful protests to expose environmental crimes. These, these protests can sometimes lead to legal action against Greenpeace organizations, staff, and activists. Courts around the world have recognized the legitimacy of Greenpeace actions and protests and the right to engage in peaceful protests in democratic societies. There's so many examples that I could, could talk about, but one of my most favorite examples comes um, from a, an activity, a climate protest in the Netherlands. After activists briefly shut down 72 Shell gas stations in 2012, they were protesting Shell's plans to drill for oil in Arctic waters. Shell sought a court order banning any further actions on or near its grounds. The Amsterdam District Court found that the action had met the requirements of subsidiarity and proportionality in human rights law and rejected Shell's demand. And in doing so, it held, and this quote's on the, on the slide, the basic principle is that organizations such as Greenpeace are in principle free to take action and to make their views publicly known. The sole fact that the action causes an inconvenience to the tar company targeted by the action, in this case Shell, does not mean that such action is wrongful. But probably one of the more high profile cases you know about um, involved a dispute arising from a Greenpeace action in 2013. This is when Russian forces detained the Greenpeace ship the Arctic Sunrise and its crew of 30 and charged them with piracy. This was in response to another peaceful protest against oil drilling in the Arctic. The Netherlands, the flag state uh, for the Greenpeace ship, began arbitration proceedings against the Russian Federation, relying on an evidence, of evidence of, um, file supplied by Greenpeace International. In August 2015, the arbitral tribunal ruled in favor of the Netherlands. It's really clearly establishes that the, the principle that there is a right to protest at sea. A settlement was eventually agreed between the Dutch and Russian governments. Meanwhile, the Arctic 30, the 30 activists, have also filed applications to the European Court of Human Rights, asserting that their right to liberty and to freedom of expression had been violated. So now going on to the advocacy efforts to strengthen environmental and protection and human rights. So unfortunately, there's a different type of lawsuit that is being brought against public watchdogs who hold, power, hold the powerful to account. These lawsuits are brought by companies and other powerful individuals, and they're designed to silence critics. They are called SLAPs, Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Participation. In response to SLAPs, suits, non-governmental organizations are forming coalitions to push back on the attempts to undermine their right to free expression and association. In 2018, 
Protect the Protest Task Force was formed in the United States with the goal of ending the threat of slaps posed to the rights of those working in the public interest. It is a completely not-for-profit initiative that serves public interest actors. They provide resources to those in, those organizations and people that are risk or already facing slaps. There's also a coalition against slaps in Europe called CASE. It's a made up of NGOs similar to Protect the Protest um, from across Europe, and they're collaborating to expose legal harassment and intimidation to protect the rights of those who do speak out and advocate for comprehensive protective measures and reform. Recently, the coalition delivered a 200,000 strong signatories on a petition to the European Commission um, calling for a strong EU anti-SLAP law. Every day, there is more and more advocacy around SLAPs from South Africa to Germany, to the UK, to Italy. So just in conclusion, um, I just want to like recognize how easy it is to become quite depressed about the state of the world. And especially when you're a lawyer like Eva or myself, who are really every day fighting, you know, fighting for justice. But I find so much hope in the people who are exercising their fundamental rights. And in 2022, this year, there will be three new scientific reports by the leading UN body telling us that we have very little time to stop catastrophic climate change. These reports will continue to spur the rise of litigation led by communities seeking to prevent the human rights harms um, that are resulting from the climate and biodiversity crises. And we will also see people rise up and exercise their right to protest in the streets and on the high seas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kristen. And now over to Eva. Sorry, um, I was trying to unmute, uh, but it, it had a few issues. But thank you so much. Uh, for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you, Christine, for setting such a solid uh, foundation for the next discussion. And um, just to give you a bit of an overview of what we do as natural justice, we are an African organization that is deeply rooted in the struggles of communities uh, to pursue environmental justice and climate justice, as well as social justice. And... Um, we work across three programmatic streams, including standing with communities, defending rights and affirming rights. And our thematic focus areas are three, and these include working with communities to um, oppose or stop fossil fuel projects or unsustainable extractives and infrastructure projects. We also work with communities to empower them or build their capacity to be able to participate effectively in decision-making processes. And finally, to work with them to affirm their rights uh, to engage in decision-making processes on matters affecting their lands and natural resources. And so today, it's such an honor and privilege to share with you and I bring with me um, experiences of different communities who we walk this journey with and I will try and show you how we use litigation and other strategies to secure their human rights and environmental justice. So before really going into the nitty-gritties, um, I, I wonder what comes to your mind when you think of the term environmental justice. Um, I mean, this concept, if we were to give ourselves an opportunity to, to say what it means for us, I believe none of us or not even two people would have the same definition. And it's because we perceive environmental justice in different ways. For some people, it's an abstract concept. But for others, um, especially community members, uh, it's, it's, it's something that they can relate to based on the impacts that they have to deal with whenever environmental degradation takes place in, in, in their place, in, in their environment. 
And um, there isn't any other better way I could describe this concept without really sharing with you one story of a community in the coastal region that is impacted by salt, a salt mining project. And the name of the project is Kurawa Salt Mining. So here is a picture of mangrove uh, a mangrove forest that was cleared by this company to pave way for setting up salt pans, which are used to manufacture salt for commercial purposes. Bear in mind that mangrove forests are very important when it comes to acting as carbon sinks, as well as um, creating an environment where fish and other species in the ocean can, can breed. Another impact that we have seen from this project is that because of the seepage of salt and infiltration into the soil, uh, there's a lot of water contamination that takes place. And so thousands of communities, especially women and girls, have to walk very long distances distances to look for water. And uh, when, when you also look at the coast already, the impacts of climate change have actually placed a lot of stress on the few freshwater sources that they have. And what is the reason? The reason why I'm sharing this story with you is because it really goes to the core of environmental issues that we face. It shows that environmental matters climate matters are actually issues of justice and human rights. And so I call it the justice crisis because the, the recurring pattern that we see across the board is that environmental harms are consistently concentrated in communities with less wealth, less power, or those who face discrimination for one reason or another. So for a community like the one we've seen in Kurawa, many of the children may have to sleep hungry because of people who are exploiting them. And so it's a system of exploitation and it's one that we will need to confront in order to make sure that we solve the crisis that we are in. And so I'll spend the, the next couple of minutes just sharing a little bit about how communities we work with are confronting these injustices. And hopefully from what I share, we can all find um, inspiration in terms of what are some of the ways in which as lawyers, we can continue engaging and we can continue challenging these injustices. The case I want to share with you, I'm not sure whether some of you have heard of it, but it's called the Lamu Coal Plant Case. And although this is the common name it's referred to, I, I want to call it a story of when the power of the law meets the power of organizing so that we can really relate to it more, especially in the context of what we are speaking about today. So this is, this is a small town in the coastal region. It's called Lamu. Um, Lamu is... Uh, recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And for that, that reason, it needs to be protected because it, it has a really rich culture that goes back to, the, to, to uh, many ages ago. Um, it, it has a very vast ecosystem that is rich and biodiversity that is well conserved. Most of the communities who live in this region depend on tourism, because there's a lot of cultural sites in the area. There's also uh, a lot of fishing, which the community depend depends on for their livelihood, as well as farming. And so um, back, back a while back in, in around 2012, the government wanted to set up a coal power plant, a coal fired power plant in this region that was very, very ecologically sensitive. And um, the, the community in this area were very concerned because of the potential impact that could, have a, that, that could arise uh, from setting up this coal plant in this area. And so aggrieved by the process that uh, was conducted in terms of the um, granting of the license 
to to go ahead and set up the the, the plant um it was the commun the communities found that they were not well engaged and so they felt that that um setting up the plant would really impact their lives in many ways and this is where their journey towards um fighting for justice began and so when you look at some of the approaches that the community used um they used a combination of uh, strategies and um this yielded actually a lot of positive res results and this combination of strategies of course paved the way for even a greater impact beyond the specific case so i call it greater impact because it's the kind of change you want to see within the entire system um and 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 so the, the four strategies i've highlighted here include community organizing legal empowerment litigation campaign and advocacy and i'll go through each of them just to give um a a, a practical demonstration of how this played out um in this struggle this is a picture of uh some some of the people uh in that community demonstrating and um when 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 this fight started the community came together and formed um a sort of a, a movement and they call it decolonize so not decolonize like the past <laughs> colonization we saw um it's it's decolonized with coal in the middle so the aim of the movement is really to um campaign i mean put forward campaign and advocacy initiatives against coal projects in Kenya and push for a greener and sustainable future for the country and um one thing that um I think led to the success of this campaign was that the fight was not only for the communities themselves, but they were also able to get a lot of support and solidarity from other civil society organizations, other communities as well who are facing similar challenges. And so that is how they were able to organize themselves and come together. So the next step um, was to conduct legal empowerment for the communities and i like to summarize it in um this three step process which we call knowing the law using the law and shaping the law so the idea of legal empowerment for us is is to find ways of making the law accessible to the communities and placing it in their hands so that they are able to use it to assert those rights. And so in terms of knowing the law and using the law, what happened with this case is that the community was um the the, the community worked together with people we we'll, we call paralegals um to help them understand what rights they have under the law and participate and because and after understanding these rights taking the opportunity to participate in the environmental decision making process. So these paralegals or the people we call community legal environmental officers are people who come from the, within the community and they develop their knowledge around certain issues and work hand in hand together with the communities to solve their problems. So the paralegals are not there to give or issue solutions for the prob problem but to work together with the communities to find the best solutions and um, one of the opportunities that they made use of is the environmental impact assessment processes so this is one of the processes or due diligence process that is used to really understand um to understand what could be the potential impacts and list give an opportunity for the public to air their views and concerns so that at the end of the day any decisions are made that are made take into account these concerns that have been raised so the communities after understanding these rights really attended hearings were able to engage with administrative institutions by writing letters filing complaints you know and um ensuring that their concerns reflected throughout the process and the last stage which is shaping the law 
is, is a concept where we seek to ensure that the lived experiences of communities ultimately influence how the law is phrased. So it's a way of building from bottom up, you know, and uh, ensuring that the law is reflective of the real and practical experiences of communities. And therefore, through legal empowerment, really it's about breathing life into the law, uh, testing the law, and through this testing of the law and processes, we are able to identify weaknesses, any challenges, and therefore shape the law through these lived experiences. So ultimately, um, th this is a photo of um, the day the judgment was given um, in, in, in 2016, the judgment for this coal plant case, because after trying all other administrative channels to seek justice, it was unfortunate that um, the administrative institution, the environmental regulator, went ahead to issue an environmental license, despite all the concerns that were raised despite every um, concern that communities brought forward. And so um, because of this, we ultimately had to resort to litigation. But the kind of litigation that we experienced through this, um, call, through this court process was a different one because this was community-led. It was one where communities were really at the forefront of the litigation process attending courts, participating in drafting of, of um, the court documents, giving witness statements, engaging directly with members of the tribunal. And so it really brought a different experience with it where um, the law, we, we, we really came to, so, to see how um, the law is not just meant for lawyers and experts, but communities themselves can equally contribute more uh, towards it. And so on, on in, in 2016, in July 2016, the court issued a, a judgment and um, the license was suspended and so the project could not proceed. And the main reason for this was because um, the the there was no adequate public participation and the court found that there wasn't adequate consideration of climate impacts as well, among others. And I, I really love to refer to one of the paragraphs in this judgment. Um, I do not have the words verbatim, but I do remember and recall the court saying that um, in any environmental impact assessment where there isn't proper public participation, it amounts to just an, an, an academic exercise. Because whenever communities are engaged, the chances of making better decisions for our future and for our planet are guaranteed. Sorry. Um, so as I conclude, I want to um, refer to this quote, which says, there are many times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. And I love that Christine spoke about some of the challenges we face. And for sure, um, it might look beautiful on paper as I explain it, but there's more to it. And the, the, the price or the cost of environmental justice is sometimes costly. And people have lost their lives for this because for, for many of these communities, it's a matter of life and death. Um, uh, as, as recent as last year, it, it really made me sad, sad to learn that, um, I mean, I learned from, from a report by Global Witness that at least four environmental defenders are, are killed every week. I mean, this, these figures are quite huge and, and sometimes it can be very discouraging for them. But I think we should learn to stand and uh, confront these kinds of repression. It shouldn't be the reason why we stop uh, and, and don't say something about any injustices that we see around us. And so um, there are many organizations out there that are giving support in different ways to protect defenders. So for instance, at Natural Justice, we have set up um, an African Environmental Defenders Emergency Fund that provides um, uh, 
emergency responses whenever a defender is facing um, certain challenges like threats, physical attack, or even slap suits, like Christine has explained. Um, and I know others are also giving longer term support in the form of legal support or um, uh, capacity building and training. So I believe that the fight, the fight should, shouldn't stop at the repression stage. We should continue pushing and forging ahead. Thank you so much. And um, I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you both so much. And thank you especially to both of you for ending with those calls to really forge ahead, which I think really speaks to uh, the people who are in this room who will have the potential to go forward and forge ahead. And with that, I, I mean, I have so many things that I would love to ask both of you, but I really want to uh, give the everyone else here a chance to ask their questions. So with that, I'll go ahead and open it up to the floor for questions for our panelists. Were you able to hear that? I wasn't. Could you repeat, Monica? Sure. Yeah. sure. So the, the question was that in the US at the state level, there's been a proliferation of bills specifically criminalizing and targeting pipeline protests. And the question is whether that is has uh, had uh, a similar, if there have been similar uh, bills or, or laws internationally, um, or if that's uh, unique to the US. I think that's a, I, do you mind if I go? Ava, do you wanna go? Do you wanna talk about maybe in Kenya? I, there are other bills and efforts to shrink and uh, the civil space. Um, and I'm not thinking of like particular examples right now, but I could, pull them up um case which is one of the the examples of the european one i think that we could look to their website and other and and find those examples um and i think it's just really key that this is one of the roles and enabling the movement climate justice movement is also about challenging these laws and these restrictions on the on the civic space Yeah, thanks, Christine. And and maybe I can also add on that. Based on our experience, I agree that shrinking civic space is something that's very common. Um, I mean, it, it it goes beyond just the the US. And in Kenya, for example, we've had instances where laws or provisions in the law have been used as a way of you know bringing and criminalizing defenders. Um, there there is one law I remember. It's it's the public order which they tried to amend uh, to provide that where um, there's peaceful demonstration and for some reason it, it turns violent and people start, you know, looting. Then the organizers of that protest are the ones who will be strictly liable under criminal law. So in short, whether you are the reason or whether you're the one who caused the kills, you are going to be liable. And, and it sparked a lot of debate across um, the, the, the region. And, and I believe that, uh, with a lot of advocacy that was mounted around that law, it was eventually struck, struck down because really sometimes it's, it's, it's an issue of malice. You might be holding um, demonstrations very peacefully and maybe the people who are not happy with what you're doing send goons and, and things turn out chaotic. So why would you hold me strictly liable without even um, taking me through a fair process? So that's that's an example I can give. Um, aside from that, there, there are cases where 
our partners and even paralegals have experienced the, the same. So our law provides that when you want to hold demonstrations, for instance, you have to um, inform or notify the police and authorities about your intention. But whenever police officers learned about community meetings and gatherings, they would come and tell the paralegals that um, the law requires you to take out a license. I mean, that, that's not something that exists in our law. So I think, again, where, where people know what the law really says and what it means, then we would not have a situation where authorities take advantage of certain gaps or provisions in the law to oppress them. So th those are some of the examples I can, I can give. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that's really helpful and a, a good reminder that these are, it's not just the, the climate crisis that's global, but also some of the uh, repression of efforts to combat the climate crisis is really something that we're seeing all around the world. Uh, other questions? Gabriella? Did you both hear that one? Uh, the question was about speaking to the intersection of climate change, human rights, and migration, and any specific cases that you've come across. Do you want me to go, Christine? OK. So yeah, I think in, in terms of climate change, uh, intersection between climate change and human rights, for sure, this is this is a, a huge discussion. There, there's been a lot of discussion around this area, and um, the the link is actually uh, something that that is acknowledged globally and regionally. Um, I, I, I cannot give example of a court case I have in mind at the moment, but I do know like in Kenya, for instance, climate litigation is now being centered around human rights. Most climate litigation is being phrased as a human rights issue. And the reason is the climate change impacts we are seeing across the, the region are definitely impacting the extent to which people, citizens, communities are able to enjoy their fundamental freedoms and rights. Um, one example I can I can think of um, is Cyclone Idai. It's not a cause, it, it's not a court case, but we did see how devastating the impacts were with many communities having to, you know, migrate long distances because of um, how the flooding uh, impacted impacted their lives and the lives of their families. Um, I also know here in Kenya, for instance, many of the extreme weather events we are witnessing, um, including the recent locust invent in invasions, which have been eating up crops, uh, leading to drought are actually human rights issues. So, so I think um, this link is very strong and climate change is more and more being recognized as a human rights issue and, and the same cannot be distinguished and the link, to, link cannot be separated. Yeah. Beautifully said. I could just add, I mean, I think one of the trends that we're going to see in a human rights-based litigation on climate change will be around migration. Um, and, you know, we've already seen a few kind of claims being made. One was a, a Kiribati citizen in New Zealand that was seeking refugee status, and it was an unsuccessful claim. But I think that as we see the impacts, which are undeniable and existential, for communities, that there will be more and more claims revolving around migration um, and revolving around loss and damage. So it's you know as you, as we look ahead, um, the science that is that's coming out is undeniable that these are going to be the at issue. Much of the human rights based litigation that has come before it has been more on the mitigation side on policies and. Um, 
the commitments of both corporations and governments. But I think that this is an area, um, you know, if you were to be writing about something in, in law school, this could be an area where new new efforts and new thinking will be greatly needed. Yeah, thank you both so much for that. And just to the that case that you're referring to with the Kiribati uh, citizen in New Zealand is the um, Teteota case before the uh, ICCPR. For those who don't know it, that's a, a key one to know uh, in the climate litigation space. I think there was another question there on the blue gray shirt. Kristen, that one was for you. Were you able to hear it well? So the Unfortunately question, not. The, the question was specifically about the carbon majors case and the strategic decision to take that before the NHRI in the Philippines instead of going to the courts and what that, what that gave you in terms of strategy um, and what the, what the thinking was there. It's a great question. And, you know, I wish my colleague Hasmina Paudak and Dirti Maya Enda were here with me and the lawyers leading that. Um, I think that in the beginning, um, when this, when the communities and we're working with lawyers to think about what are their legal options, um, there had been no litigation um, really involving human rights claims against corporations in the climate context. So this was quite innovative. Um, and the Commission on Human Rights has been always a place of innovation and a, a place to take harder claims and a, and a place that was act accessible to communities and being able to tell their stories. And, um, and so it, it was seen as a good, a good place to begin the journey, their, their journey for justice, which will never, will not be over when the commission issues its final report. It will carry on. Um, and I think that national human rights institutions can play a really important role um, in, you know, assessing the obligations of both state and non-state actors. Um, and so I think that we'll also continue to see bodies, NHRIs around the world, um, weighing in on the issue of climate change, human rights, biodiversity, um, because it's, it's, it's an important space for these bodies to, to be active in. All right. Eva, did you want to add anything, maybe not specifically on the carbon majors, but on national human rights institutions? No, no, I think Christine has handled that well. I, I have no additions on that. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, right there in the Facebook. Yeah, question for both. Uh, how do you as attorneys balance working within the system uh, with supporting these efforts from protesters and defenders working outside the system against these you know, systemic environmental uh, problems? So the, the question was, how do you as attorneys balance working within the legal system and the sort of established boundaries of it with uh, supporting protesters and activists who are working outside of the system? Please go ahead, Eva. Uh, Monica, sorry, I, I, I think I'm not, I, I can't hear you very well, but um, sorry, can you repeat again? Sorry. Sure. Let me try to lean closer to the mic and see if that helps. Uh, yeah. The question was, uh, how do you as attorneys uh, used to working within the legal system? Uh, balance that with working with and supporting protesters and activists who are working outside of the system. 
Mm. Oh, nice. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I think for us as natural justice, from our experience, any means or um, strategies that we employ have to be within the confines of the law. So when you look at, for instance, our laws on freedom of expression and association, these are rights that are granted and guaranteed for all citizens to be able to exercise so long as um, you do not engage in violence or any other acts that could be termed to be criminal. Or, for example, if you are exercising your freedom of expression and speech, of course, there is this important thing to bear in mind that there are certain confines. Um, so a good example is our constitution in Kenya, which says that when you start spreading hate speech or when you start inciting people to violence, then that is does not amount to exercising your rights of freedom of expression. So I think um, the point I'm passing up across is that all these channels, all these avenues we use are um, strategies that have to be exercised within the confines of the law so that we are not, again, doing things that are, are illegal in nature. Yeah. Thanks, Eva. Um, I think that for me, that's a, that's an interesting question because I started as a youth climate activist running grassroots campaigns to transform universities and cities into renewable energy champions. And I think it was in the early 2000s, I got my taste of the kind of the first ever climate litigation, but working from the outside. And, and um, when I was involved in that case, I really saw the power of the law as a tactic in campaigning for change. Um, and so this just made me realize that how fast society is going to transition out of fossil fuels and into more sustainable practices is in large part going to be on the trajectory of law. Um, and so, you know, I went to law school to acquire that tool because it's just one of the tools in the toolbox for activists um, to create that change. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I, I, you know, I don't really, I, I, I don't see the separation between the two of being an activist and being a lawyer um, and seeing the law as one of those tools in our toolbox to affect change. Thanks. I, hmm. I think the, the idea that the speed of change is tied to the, the trajectory of the law is a really, I think, interesting and maybe slightly discouraging one, but hopefully not. And hopefully gives us all a motivation rather than a despair. Other questions? Hi, my name is Lee. Um, I'm so grateful, Kristen, and you both that you joined us today. Thank you for your time. Um, I was particularly struck by how you both finished your presentations um, on a very similar note. Um, Kristen, you talked about you know how easy it is to become depressed, and but how there's so much hope in exercising our human rights. And Eva, you had that, that wonderful quote from from Giselle. Um, it reminded me of the Gramsci talking about. Uh, um, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. Um, and, you know, we're, we're sitting, I'm sitting in a room full of students who are interested in climate justice and human rights, and I get to talk to a lot of them, and many of them are uh, extremely pessimistic, certainly pessimistic uh, of the intellect. Um, and so I was hoping that you might be able to share any advice, any personal advice or strategies that, that you have you know, that help you wake up every day and continue to do this work. So I, I'm not going to be able to recapture the eloquence yeah, I apologize. I apologize. of that question, but the gist of it was given that this can be very difficult uh, work to do and the, the, the situation at times looks quite bleak, do you have any advice for what keeps you personally motivated and able to keep doing this work every day? Thanks for, for that question. I think that's that's very important. And I, I often get that question a lot. 
and and one of the the people I always like to to refer to is uh, Professor the late Professor Wangari Mathai, um, you know, no, Nobel Peace Prize winner from Kenya. I think she 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 of course prepared this story called the hummingbird. The, I don't know whether some of you have heard about it, but I, I know that the fight can be difficult. But really, it's about doing what you can. Um, with the with the match that you have so you may not be able of course to conquer the world or the globe or everything but whatever is happening within this space are you doing something about it or you or are you sitting down like the rest the rest of the people around you and 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 looking at injustices happen um close to you it's about just looking about around you around your communities is there something wrong is there something you think needs to be challenged in any way and doing something about it. So I, I would have loved to share the video with you, but um, just go look up the story of the hummingbird. Um, and it's, it's my encouragement to you to, to just, you know, do what you can in that space. And of course, um, keep keep your networks and, and, and continue being in solidarity with people sharing similar struggles. So there are many other communities out there who are equally trying to confront these issues. And so if you if you keep networking, if you keep being in solidarity with them, it sort of gives you a lot of encouraging uh, encouragement. And, and I love the story of the coal plant again, because through their story, there's so many other communities who've equally been encouraged. In Zimbabwe, for instance, communities are facing issues of coal, uh, coal plant projects, and they've been able to really learn a lot and get encouragement from this experience that the communities have. Because at some point when this fight was starting, they equally felt powerless. They felt like there was nothing they could do. And even people within their communities themselves felt like this was a fight that could end up nowhere because you're going up against powerful people, political and monetary interests. It doesn't look like we can get something out of it. So I think it's good to, to share those experiences and connect more. Yeah. I know what I'm going to do after this uh, webinar. I'm going to go and look up the, the hummingbird. I'm, I'm on that. So thank you for that. Um, I think that there's kind of three parts that keep me going. And 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 there are things that I've learned from other people who've been this in the struggle for so long. Like I'm learning from so many around me. And one is to just stay grounded and be outside and just be in nature. That keeps me personally like just and a good to carry on. I think this one is exactly what you were saying with, with the Lamu community, but being in community um, and surrounding yourself with, you know, the activists and the community you need that understands what you're doing and to carry on. Um, and then the other thing that, that our team is starting to do more and more, um, because our legal coordinator, Casey Valente, is really, really big on this, is celebrating.